Welcome back to this special CNN Town Hall, Finding Hope, Battling America's Suicide Crisis. Right now, if you or a loved one is thinking of suicide, I urge you to reach out for help. On the bottom of your screen, we continue to show you the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and other organizations. Please don't hesitate to make the phone call. Hope is such an important word in this discussion, and if you're feeling hopeless or know someone who is, there is help and there is a way through. I want you all to meet uh, Jordan uh, Burnham, who at 18 nearly died by suicide. He survived. It was 11 years ago. I'm very happy, Jordan, that you are uh, with us tonight. Thanks so Thank much for, for being me. here. Absolutely. Um, we're we're talking about hope tonight, and I'm wondering just how you held on to hope and and kind of came back to a place of hopefulness after being hopeless. Yeah, it was it was difficult because at that point, you know, I was 18. I attempted suicide by going out of my nine-story bedroom window. So I'm laying in a hospital and I'm down to 80 pounds. I can't move. I, I can't talk. But what I did have was the support of my parents, my family, my sister, um, the community. Um, I had all of that support surrounding me. Um, but in the midst of all of that, I was able to share my story um, with a reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. And at that point, I had a trach in my throat, so I didn't even have a, uh, have a voice. But I felt I had a story mm -hmm. that could hopefully help other people and feel as though they're not alone. You wanted even at that time, so soon after, to, to try to help other people. Absolutely. I was incredibly grateful to be alive. I had to accept that my body was never going to be the same. I also had, had to accept this is a suicide attempt. But I knew that it wouldn't define me if I share my story myself in trying to help others. So at that point, I had hope by trying to help others. I, I heard you say that, that one question you hear the most from people is, you know, what's the one thing that, that What's the one conversation that, that people could have had with you that, that would have helped? You say that's kind of the wrong question to ask. Right. I think the better question is, what's the culture that could, you could have been surrounded by that probably could have helped myself with my mental health issues in having that conversation? I felt like I couldn't do that when I was a teenager. I, I felt ashamed to admit when I wasn't getting enough sleep or my appetite was inconsistent. I felt ashamed that I couldn't wake up and get out of bed and that I didn't feel like myself. So I felt like there wasn't an open culture when it comes to talking about when we're struggling and our mental health issues. And now I'm starting to see a change in that. Mm. I also want everybody to meet uh, Desiree Stage, who's also uh, with us tonight, who's also a, uh, a survivor uh, of suicide. You're, you're founder of a project called Live Through This. You take portraits of, of other survivors. What's, wh why do you feel that's so important to, to show others? For me, when when I first started this project, I wasn't seeing a reflection of um, stories like mine. I thought I was the only person uh, in my life who had attempted suicide, and I came later to find out that that is not the case. I'm sitting next to two other suicide attempt survivors. Um, I I wanted to show that. I wanted to, to to show that we we are people. We're just like everyone else. We come from different cultures, different backgrounds, SES, age range, gender presentation, sexual orientation, that, that suicide doesn't discriminate, essentially. Getting through it, there is life after it. Yeah, there's, there's life after, and that's not to say that life is easy. It gets better, it might get worse again, it might get better again. Um, but I think in, in interviewing 185 other suicide attempt survivors, what I've learned is that we struggle, but we struggle better over time, most of us. For me, that's the real message of hope, is that it might continue to hurt. You might continue to have suicidal thoughts, but you can still get through it. And the people who I've interviewed are, are perfect examples of that. I think it's such an important message, Doctor, that, that you know, um, that you can lead a, a great life. I mean, that you can, you can get, you, you just gotta get through that, that, that moment. Absolutely, and we're hearing about the, the challenges are several fold, but once people get past stigma and are able to start talking about what they're experiencing as actual changes in their health, just like they would if they were physical health changes, that takes care of one huge layer. We can learn what actually leads to our best outcomes, what causes, what triggers us to spiral downward. Um, we can learn how to, how to actually fine tune things. It's not a perfect science, um, but just like Desiree was saying, you can actually learn that. Um, if somebody right now is in crisis watching this, what, what would you say to, to them? 
If someone is in crisis right now, I would say reach out to someone, take the risk, because it's a scary thing to do, but there are people who love you, you are not alone, and to, to reach out and speak to somebody about what you're going through. If you can't do that with someone in your life, then call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline or text the Crisis Text Line. Those are available 24-7. Um, I would also say that if you're a viewer watching right now, and at some point throughout the show you've been thinking, I wonder if some of those warning signs apply to this person in my life, that is probably a sure sign that there, it's time to reach out to that person. And it's okay to have that conversation. Yes, absolutely. Jordan, thank you so much for, for being with us. That's right. Well, it's great to see you. Uh, Dr. Moutier, thank you so much. We began the hour talking about two deaths uh, by suicide, Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain. Earlier, I mentioned how one of the, the terrible things about suicide in my, in my life is, is you end up focusing on how someone's life ended, sometimes not on how they lived their life. So with that in mind, we just want to take a few moments to remember the life and the passion of our colleague and our friend, Anthony Bourdain. You know, food is the entryway. I'm a guy who spent 30 years cooking food professionally. Uh, that's where I come from. That's how I'm always going to look at the world. But food isn't everything. And, and something comes up, I'm happy to get up from the meal and wander off elsewhere. Anthony Bourdain saw the world and experienced life in a way most people never will. In places near and far, he talked and tasted with open mouth and eyes an open heart and mind. By the time of his death, Anthony had visited more than 80 countries, many of them multiple times. Even if food was not your passion, Anthony could enthrall you with what he saw and learned in the places he went. He was born Anthony Michael Bourdain on June 25, 1956. He grew up in New Jersey, but spent time with relatives in France in the summers. That's where he developed his appreciation of fine foods. In 1999, when Anthony was 44, he sent a humorous and slightly shocking essay to The New Yorker magazine about the realities of working in a restaurant kitchen. Then, in 2012, joined CNN. Parts Unknown, which won plenty of awards over the years, was far more than a show about just cooking and eating. Anthony was a great storyteller. His voice was unique and fearless. He was as interested in politics and music and culture as what was cooking on the stove. I describe Parts Unknown as a series of essays, of standalone essays that generally try to focus on the subject of food and where it comes from, but not always. He was married twice and in 2007 welcomed a daughter, Ariane, into the world. After she was born, he told People magazine that she gave him a reason to live. It's impossible from the outside to ever fully know what goes on in someone else's heart or in their head. It's impossible to fathom how quickly one's life can change. Anthony once wrote, as you move through this life and this world, you change things slightly. You leave marks behind, however small. And in return, life and travel leaves marks on you. Most of the time, those marks on your body or your heart are beautiful. Often though, they hurt. The hurt for all of us who knew Anthony, for all of us who came to know him through his travels, that hurt is strong. The shock is real. The sadness is just beginning to sink in. Anthony Burdain was 61 years old. I want to thank everybody for participating uh, in this town hall tonight. I want to thank Dr. Muti again and, and really everyone for, for being here. Uh, and just to remind anyone watching that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline answers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The number again, 1-800-273-8255. Also online, the International Association for Suicide Prevention. The web address is there on your screen, wherever you are in the world. And for additional resources and coverage of this vital issue, you can go to this page on CNN.com. Thanks very much for watching. Right now, this season's final two episodes of Anthony Bourdain, Hearts Unknown.